So let's talk about the risk factors for impaired gas exchange. It's as usual, the very young and the very old are at most risk infants because of um, infant physiologic anemia and less alveolar surface in their lungs for gas exchange to happen. And they also have narrowed airways. Interestingly, the trachea uh, on a person is about the, the diameter of their pinky. So think about the pinky on a neonatal baby, extremely small. And so it doesn't take much swelling in an airway for there to be occlusion when you're starting with a an airway the size of your pinky. Now with an older adult, there are some ana anatomical and physiologic changes that happen with aging that put them at more risk for gas exchange impairment. Things like their chest wall becomes more stiff and their muscles become more weak. And there can be changes in the alveoli. Remember the alveoli are those air sacs that where gas exchange happens in the lungs. And also there are increased uh, risk for infection as their immune response, response decreases as they age. Now, I think some of these individual risk factors would come at no surprise. Things like age, sm smoking, um, any uh, chronic medical conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and a, a chronic lung disease, cystic fibrosis, where the lungs become um, really firm and hard and immovable um, lung and heart failure. Anytime we've got a, because your pulmonary system and your cardiac system work hand in hand. Anyone who's immunosuppressed, anyone who's reduced state of cognition, their brain not, might not be telling them the drive to breathe. Any brain injury or prolonged immobility also put patients at risk for impaired gas exchange. Now your Davis text talks about some factors that influence pulmonary function. Pulmonary, remember, means lung. So factors that influence lung function. Let's take a look at those together. This is from Davis in page 965. Any upper respiratory infections or lower respiratory infections certainly are going to impact pulmonary function. And any pulmonary uh, system abnormalities, any atelectasis, which is the collapse of the alveoli, any pulmonary circulation abnormalities, central nervous system abnormalities, neuromuscular abnormalities, all of these systems, the pulmonary system, the central nervous system, the neuromuscular system, all interrelate with pulmonary function. So we know that oxygenation is, is vital and uh, for life. And so we need to be able to recognize when patients have impairment and, and compromised gas exchange. So in terms of assessment, we're going to take a history on their health and we're going to do an examination. I'd like you to pause here and read through the assessment portion on the screen as well as in your Giddens text. Now there are a number of diagnostic tests that we can run in terms of testing for gas exchange, things like arterial blood gases, CBCs telling us about our red blood cell counts and uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin. Um, pathology tests, things like biopsies, chest x-rays. We do a dime a dozen. They're so, they're inexpensive. They give us a lot of information. And we have other more advanced radiologic studies like CTs, MRIs, BQ scans and PET scans. Pulmonary function studies and endoscopies are other more invasive procedures that can give us information about a patient's um, respiratory status. So we know that a lot of patients have impairment and gas exchange, but we need to know what to do about it. So let's talk about nursing and collaborative interventions. As always, it starts with primary prevention, preventing infection, smoking cessation, keeping up with immunizations, and preventing post-operative complications, things like immobility and not taking deep breaths, that can result in gas exchange issues. So if we can, if we can prevent these issues from happening in the first place, we're in a better spot. Now, in terms of screening, the Mantu skin test, otherwise known as a TB test, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, an intradermal skin test that we can do to test for the presence of tuberculosis. And um, quantifiron is another way we can test for that, but it's a nice way to test if someone has a very contagious um, disease of the respiratory system called tuberculosis. Now, in terms of collaborative interventions, smoking sensation, uh, pharmaco pharmacotherapy, oxygen therapy, uh, airway management and breathing supports, chest physiotherapy, postular drainage. We're gonna talk about these more in detail in your books. 
there are more invasive procedures like chest tubes and um, tapping someone's chest to get extra fluid off, doing a bronchoscopy, putting them to sleep and putting a, a camera down their throat to look down into their lungs, nutrition therapy and positioning. All of these things can really help um, with patients. And so medications, oxygen, airway management, breathing support, um, all of these things really can help our patients with, with respiratory issues. Now, in terms of pharmac pharmacology, your book has some nice um, tables in your Davis text, as well as a list in Giddens, things like antihistamines, decongestants, and sympathomimetics, uh, which is uh, just your like Sudafed can really help with any upper airway congestion. And then in terms of lower airway congestion, we're talking about steroids, inhalers, nebulizers that can open up and dilate airways, anticholinergics, reduce the amount of um, uh, fluids in the lungs, and then cough suppressants can also help. So all of these things are really helpful when it talks about respiratory. There's a long list of things that we use for drugs related to the respiratory system. And we'll be talking about these more individually as they relate to the exemplars that we're talking about. Now, in terms of oxygen therapy, there are a number of things that we can do um, to help patients breathe better. Typical standard little nasal cannula, that's what this kiddo's got down here uh, on their nose, just a small tube that provides a few liters of oxygen. A simple face mask is something kind of like this up here without the bag on it. A non-rebreather mask where they literally are getting like 100% oxygen. A nebulizer breathing treatment um, that delivers uh, medications down into the lungs, things like for asthma patients. And then a ventilator, which is an actual breathing machine that not only delivers um, air, but it actually pushes that air in and out. It ventilates. Remember we talk about air movement. It not only gives you oxygen that you can breathe in yourself, but it actually moves that air in and out of your lungs. Now, there are a number of things that we need to do to manage airways. Remember, before you can breathe, you have to be able to have a clear airway from the outside to down into your lungs where air can move, where you can ventilate. And so we may do things like suctioning or putting in airways um, to help keep things open so that the tongue isn't obstructing it um, and that they have a patent airway down from the outside down into their into their lungs. And when that's not possible, we can create our other airways, either intubations, where we put a breathing tube down their mouth, down their trachea, or a tracheostomy where it's surgically, a, a, a surgical trach is put in here, and then the patient's able to ventilate, moving air in and out through um, the tracheostomy, which is what you've got here in this picture on the left. A number of interrelated concepts for the concept of gas exchange. Gas exchange and perfusion, very closely related. Acid-base balance. Remember, there's two systems that are most involved in acid-base balance, and one of them is the respiratory system. Anxiety. If you don't have the oxygen you need, it can become very anxiety-provoking very quickly. Fatigue, also having to do with lack of oxygenation. Mobility has a lot to do with gas exchange, as does nutrition. There are a number of featured exemplars in your Giddens text. The ones we're gonna be talking about this week specifically are asthma and pneumonia. And we'll be getting into all the rest of these during the course of your two years at Morton because these are all extremely important exemplars that you're gonna be seeing. And you'll need to know not only about this exemplar, but about the medications and the treatments that are important when you're recognizing and treating patients with these issues. Uh, not only are these things in your Giddens text, but we put a, an exemplar on Blackboard that's going to help you understand this better as well. So you can take a look at that reference. All right, that's going to do it for our uh, talk on gas exchange. I hope this was helpful. See you soon.